it's Nancy Crawshaw from the Extension team at Angus Australia and welcome to our second edition of Paddock Talk for 2025. This time we're delighted to be beefing up the episode and we'll be joined by Dr Pete McGilchrist who's going to go through some updates that have happened with the Angus Sire benchmarking program and talk about what changes we've seen in the beef industry and the genetic side of what's happening with the beef coming out as the end product. And then we'll also be catching up with Joel from Super Butchers in Brisbane to give us a bit more insights into what the consumers who are purchasing our beef at the end of the supply chain are looking for and what's sort of driving their decision making process. And we've also got Hunley Jensen doing the answer station again who I know she'll have some great insights to share with you. So we hope you enjoy this episode of Paddock Talk. G'day, I'm Peter McGilchrist, a Professor of Meat Science at the University of New England in Armidale. And uh, over the last seven years since I've been there, we've been analysing the meat science side of the Angus Sire benchmarking project steers. And we've seen all amazing changes across that time, just in that few seven years. But people are really focusing on it. And last year we saw our first couple of Marble Score nines out of a purebred Angus, which for me as a meat scientist is pretty pretty exciting. Shows you that we can pin our ears back and, and select on something and, and make a lot of change. So I wanted to chat with you today just a little bit about balancing meat and you know, if it was all all about, for me, it'd be all about meat, but of course we've got to make these animals functional on farm uh, and then that suit that market as well. So, you know, probably 70 or 80% of the income comes from having that animal that's functional on farm and then, and then that last, you know, the real cream on the crop comes from getting those animals very suitable for market and keeps people coming back to the great Angus breed. So what I want to talk about today is maybe balancing that, that assessment of, of the bulls that we buy because they have a massive impact on it and, and then the importance of, of meat traits within that. So when we look at a carcass, value of a carcass is, is driven by two things only. The quantity of meat we can sell from that carcass and then the quality of that meat. So it's actually really, really simple. And at this point in time, we don't have a whole lot of um, breeding values around that. So we've got retail beef yield, which is the yield component, how much meat there is. So so that's important. I'd love to get more more data into into uh, breed plan for that component. But there's, there's, there's Angus breeds got uh, probably well, it's absolutely got the most uh, bone outs of, of any breed at all. The others have got a few hundred compared to thousands that are in the Angus database. Everyone loves to have a certain amount of fat in the system. So we're talking about subcutaneous fat, so those rib and rump fats. That's important to have enough in there so those heifers get back in calf, you know, especially those first calf heifers. Um, you know, the, those he cows do well in those periods of suboptimal nutrition. Our climate's going to get more variable as we go forward. We're going to have longer dry spells, longer wet spells. So we need our cattle to be able to perform during them. Subcutaneous fat is a much bigger depot than marbling. So it's like having a, a fuel tank and our IMF is like our sub tank in the cruiser. It, it's, it's still fuel for those animals going through that suboptimal nutrition. But you can't select on one and get the other one because the correlation at these, this point in time because of your great selection pressure in the Angus breed is actually zero. So if you select for high rib and rump fat, doesn't mean you're getting IMF. You've got to select on IMF itself. So I would say that uh, if you're below average on IMF, you're actually behind the behind the eight ball. And, and really you've got to look at Angus. We've got a high cost of production in this country and, and this is a premium product. We're no longer, Angus are no longer in the, in the in the realms of producing commodity beef. We're out of that. It's long gone. It's a bygone era. So if you don't have selection pressure on IMF, I think my view, you need to have a good hard look at yourself because uh, Angus has, has positioned themselves as the premium breed and we need to move for our consumers with that. Otherwise, otherwise that, uh, that brand will, will degrade over time and we definitely don't want that to happen. Another really thing I'm passionate about um, in, in Angus and Angus breeding uh, is, is around the time, of, time we spend on feed in this country. So days on feed is a thing we see on the restaurant menus. Um, uh, and I'd like to see as we advance our genetics for marbling, we're getting more and more that we can start reducing that days on feed. So we're having a sustainability benefit, but we're still maintaining the quality of the, of the meat that's going to our consumers. I think this breed of any breeds have got the ability to do that now. Um, but certainly into the future, we've got to start thinking about, okay, how much quality is enough? And then can we get that after, after 100 days on feed rather than 150 or 200 or 270 days on feed? I think those long, long feeding programs are, 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 in, the, are in the gun 
uh, my view. Um, going forward in terms of you know energy use and grains and things like that. We don't need those long times on feed to get the quality if we use the right genetics. I really always like the analogy of, of, of riding a, a scooter or a mini moke, driving a mini moke. If you've, got a, if you've got a scooter and you're in the city, which I would call bad farm management, you can go maximum speed, right? You can go the speed limit 50 kilometers an hour. But if you drive that if you drive that scooter out onto a freeway at 110, which is our good management, so it might be a feedlot or a really good grass grower, you're still going 50 and your speed limit's 110. And that's when genetics really, when, when genetics really pay off is when you match management, good management with good genetics is where we see that really elite beef come out of those systems. So hopefully you can take something home from there we're also working with the Angus society a lot on on novel and new traits you know do we need new ebvs i don't know but do we need to stay in front of where the consumers are i think so uh, and you guys are, are modern and, and forward thinking uh, more than anyone else so it's starting to think about mineral levels in the meat because people buy and pay for red meat because of the iron and zinc quantity that's in them so how does that relate to other traits that we select for? I think we need to know that. What about our fatty acids? We've done a little bit, uh, Dr. Christian Duff, through his PhD, did a bit looking at um, saturated and unsaturated fats. And the, and the really cool thing about the unsaturated fats is it's very positively correlated with IMF percent. So if we select for more IMF, we're actually getting more unsaturated fat in, in, that, in, that, uh, in that meat. So that's great for human health. And also, you know, it's positive for us uh, in terms of measuring that marbling on the carcass as well. Um, which comes into melting point in those human health aspects and also eating quality. We've been doing uh, a big project over the last three years with the USDA in, in America and also ICBF in Ireland and Australia, of course. Uh, and we've been looking if, if we can use the genotype to predict eating quality. Now that's been really in interesting as we put more and more data in there. Our accuracy now is over 80% in using the genotype to predict actual consumer outcome. So, and it's more than just IMF, it's more than just shear force. There's a whole heap of things that are genetically controlled that we can't see or measure cheaply or quickly. But if we're measuring what I call the outcome trait, right? It's, the, it's kind of the holy grail in eating quality. Uh, we've got a genomic prediction now for that. So hopefully we see that um, come to fruition in, in a uh, EBV in the, in the coming years. Uh, it would be really awesome as well because then we can select on just on pure outcome of how good that meat from that animal is to eat. So yeah, we've done some exciting things. We've got plenty of room to uh, still grow and change, uh, but it's been really exciting to watch the progression of the Angus breed through the last seven and eight uh, ASBP cohorts. Thanks very much for your time. Hi, my name is Joel Giacomantonio and I'm the General Manager of Super Butcher. I've been with Super Butcher for 15 years and we are the leading meat retailer in South East Queensland. So how have consumer preferences changed uh, for buying beef in recent years? What we've seen at Super Butcher is there's been a big swing towards uh, preferring grass-fed beef. Uh, so there's a perceived health benefit to eating grass-fed and whilst we try to educate customers around the inconsistencies that grass-fed may have, there's a preference there. So talking to them about grain-fed beef and consistency of that product doesn't outweigh the natural health benefits that people perceive grass-fed have. So we have 150,000 people in our loyalty database and we use some of that information to track uh, purchasing habits. And in the last five years, we've seen a big swing towards grass-fed beef. Um, and that's predominantly in steak cuts, so rumps, strip loins, rib fillets and eye fillets. We're seeing a massive trend up in grass-fed meat right now. So what are the biggest factors influencing customer purchasing today? The number one thing still driving customer behavior is good eating quality. They wanna make sure that the product they take home is gonna eat the way they'd like it to eat. So while we know feed's important, a breed's important, providence is important, and probably sustainability after all of them, we know the number one thing that customers want is good eating quality, and that's what they'll make their purchasing decisions on. So how important is breed branding on products such as Angus? I think this is extremely important. People associate Angus with a premium product, not only from 
a quality point of view, but from an eating point of view as well. I don't think they fully understand why or how it contributes. And I think things such as feed and marble score are quickly attributing to the offering in, in beef. So we're seeing more of attributes of beef become more important than breed, but it's not irrelevant. So our customers are more interested in learning about provenance and cooking techniques than they previously were. I think cooking techniques continue to be something that customers are looking for. They want to make sure what they're putting their hard earned into, they're getting the best result out of. So making sure that the product they buy, they cook it the correct way, is absolutely what customers are looking for. Provenance is important for customers and it makes them feel good about their purchases to know where their beef's coming from. But as I said earlier, eating quality is still the number one driving decision in beef purchases for customers. So that's what they're looking for, but they come to a place like Super, which to learn about feed, attributes of the beef, provenance and sustainability as well of all the great brands we sell. So how can the beef industry better communicate the value of Australian beef to consumers? What a challenge uh, that would be. I think we're a bit spoiled rotten um, here in Australia, particularly if you don't understand the export market and how it works. Now, export doesn't really mean a lot to domestic customers. They want to know that the product that's being born and bred here stays here. At Super Butcher, what we do is we take our staff, we have four trips we're doing this year um, to four different producers for them to learn more about you know, what goes into those programs from you know, breeding, feeding, and you know, even production, so they can bring that information back and relay it to our customers. So I think at Super Butcher, that's the number one thing we're doing is you know, exposing our staff to more of the industry to make sure that they can pass that on to our consumers. So how does beef compare to other proteins at the moment with cost of living and, and how we're going? Beef for us has increased over the last six months. So what we've seen is as our business model, bulk beef has remained the same as a percentage of sales, but we've seen beef trade increase heavily. Now, mainly through mints and smaller bundles of steak, we're seeing that increase. So we're seeing people buy more value for money cuts more often as well. So I think the number one thing with consumers is they want to continue to eat good quality beef. You know, once they get exposed to brands like what we sell, they want to continue eating that quality. So they make sacrifices elsewhere in their budgets to make sure they can afford this. And we're seeing a reduction in chicken, lamb and pork over anything as beef continues to trend up. So we've seen massive increases in um, our beef mince trade, our burger trade, our sausages. Um, and our smaller portions of steak. Uh, so over about 60% of our sales are coming from beef at the moment. Hi everyone, Hanley Jensen here from the Extension team. Just jumping on um, and in this episode of Paddock Talks and Station, um, I will be walking through a couple of handy hints when we're using Angus database search. A few things to be aware of um, is if you are making a search criteria across both Australia and New Zealand, just check that you have this selected at the top here, otherwise you may be limiting some animals from popping up. Additionally, be aware that there are a couple of quick search, saved search listings. Um, these include the size with at least 10 progeny in the last uh, two years across our entire membership. Um, the 50 most widely used size in the past two years and the size entered in the Angus Sire benchmarking program. You can also view more member specific um, saved searches including females in your inventory um, for autumn and spring or a season specific female listing as well as a whole animals currently in your ownership listing or if you want to look at yearling bulls or two-year-old bulls in your ownership you can also view them as a drop-down search. For this quick one we're just going to quickly look at the 50 most widely used sires now there are selection criteria that can be implemented on an animal details, ownership, breeding, genetic test, 
eBay Vs with the slider bars can be made as well as obviously selection indexes and RBVs. Now once we've got our search results in front of us, a couple of things to be aware of here. The first being that you can change the layout that you want to see. So you can see an expanded layout if you want to see more of those estimated breeding values that do not pop up in the default layout. Also, if you are interested in research breeding values, you can look at those under the RBVs only tab. Things to be aware of when we're looking at layouts, this will impact when we go to the report center and we want to pull a CSV listing. The CSV listing only shows the fields that are active in the search results page. So whatever you've got viewing here, is what you will see in your search results CSV download. Now, you are also able to create your own customized results layout by simply dragging across any details that you may be interested to have in your results section. Once you've selected everything and placed it in this right-hand box, make sure that you hit Save Layout As. We'll just put him in there as example and when we get across to our layout we will now only be viewing those details for those animals. You can also do this um, for the search. You can save your search if you have made a search criteria and it is one that you want to come back to quite often. It is handy to have it saved here. So just save it as your example. Um, and then next time when you are trying to find this one, it'll just show up in your drop down menu and you can find it there. I also wanted to quickly add that the same things can be done on the Angus Sales Select search function. So again, you can view uh, the sales across Australia, New Zealand or both. Um, make sure you have the right one teach there for what you're trying to do. So a couple of things when we are making our sales selection though is you can do this based off of the map and the map will highlight where those sales are occurring. To add a sale that is listed on the map simply just click on it and it'll add it there. So I'll just remove that one. You can then proceed to the animal selection criteria. So this is refining our search for specific animals now. Again, this is very similar um, to Angus database search criteria with slider bars for selection indexes and EBVs. You can then also make sure that if you're interested in lot number sort, you can do that as well. Once we've done our search, this has pulled up all of the results and you can change your default layout again here and you can also create your customized results layout here if you need to change anything or want to view anything separately. You can also access the report center from Angus database search 